This video about the 3D Voronoi diagram and tetrahedralizations assumes that you are familiar with the 2D concept. It's advised that you first watch the video from the other course, GO 1015 or DTM. The link is in the description below. To recap quickly the concepts in 2D, if we have a set of generators in the plane, such as those, the Voronoi diagram partitions the two-dimensional Euclidean space into proximity cells. The Voronoi cell of a given generator, for example the point P in orange here, represents the set of points in the, Euclid in the Euclidean space that are closer to P than to any other generators. For the Voronoi diagram in three dimensions, instead of having generator points in the plane, the two-dimensional Euclidean space, those points are embedded in the three-dimensional Euclidean space. We have therefore x, y, z coordinates for each point. These points can be, for example, LiDAR points, and or they can also have attributes attached to them. Imagine, for instance, that I have a device to measure the temperature. I could be walking around a building and recording at different locations the temperature. The three-dimensional Warner diagram has essentially the exact same definition as its 2D counterpart. One Voronoi cell is a proximity cell, but this cell is defined by the space in the Euclidean space in three dimension and not in two dimension. As you can see here for two generators, the Voronoi diagram is simple. We divide the space into two half space and this creates two unbounded Voronoi cells. The Voronoi diagram in this case is defined by one plane, which is at the uh, same distance from the two generators. It can be obtained by drawing a plane perpendicular to the line segment between the two generators at the half point. For more generators, for example three in this case, we can do the same for every pair of generators and then we will obtain three planes. If we intersect these three planes, we will obtain one Voronoi edge, the, uh, the edge in orange here, and this edge will be equidistant to the three generators. And by doing so, we will also obtain three Voronoi cells and notice that uh, these three cells are unbounded, so they have uh, infinity volume. You can see here the Voronoi diagram in three dimensions for a set of about 30 points. The Voronoi edges are drawn in red. In 3D, the Voronoi diagram is a 3D cell complex and each cell is a complex polyhedron. Visualizing the 3D Voronoi diagram is difficult, but if we draw only one cell, like you can see here in bluish, you can get a good idea of how it looks like. Notice that the cell is bounded because its generator is not located on the boundary of the convex hull of the set of the points. In 2D, the Delaunay triangulation is a simplicial complex where each simplex, a triangle, has an empty circumcircle. In three dimensions, a simplex is a tetrahedron. And to be Delaunay, this tetrahedron needs to have its circumsphere empty. That is, it must not contain any other generator in the set inside the sphere that is circumscribed to the four uh, vertices that create the uh, tetrahedron. The 3D Delaunay triangulation is also called a tetrahedralization and you can see one for the same set of about 30 points. Only the edges of the tetrahedra are drawn in blue. First notice that the convex hull of the set of points is decomposed into several tetrahedra. You can see here in bluish one tetrahedron, and in lighter blue it's four adjacent tetrahedra. Almost all of the properties of the 2D Delaunay triangulation can be generalized to 3D, in a, and that in a straightforward way. The most important property to be aware of is the angle optimality. We know that in 2D, the Delaunay triangulation will contain triangles that are as equilateral as possible. That is, we will create triangles that are fat. Given four points, the diagonal yielding the largest minimum internal angle is the Delaunay diagonal. However, in 3D, the angle optimality is not valid. 
That is, a Delaunay tetrahedralization will contain tetrahedra that have their four vertices located nearly on a plane. We call these slivers, and they're not very well suited for interpolation or for finite element uh, analysis in engineering. You can see here uh, the same set of 30 points that we used before, and you can see one uh, example of such a sliver. Notice that this tetrahedron has an empty circumsphere and that it's Delaunay, but yet its four vertices are lying nearly on a plane. To help you visualize what the output of the Delaunay tetrahedralization is, uh, here's another example. You can first see here around a thousand points that were randomly generated inside a cube. Then you can see what the surface of the convex hull is in blue and notice that only a subset of these points form the convex hull. And then at this step here what I did is I sliced uh, horizontally in the middle all the tetrahedra and I removed all the ones that were above the planes and then you can see that the interior of the tetrahedralization is formed of several Delaunay tetrahedra. It should be added that while the Delaunay tetrahedralization is not suitable for interpolation in some applications, there's a long list of applications for which the Delaunay tetrahedralization is very suitable. A few of them are described in the lecture notes. As it's the case in two dimensions, in three dimensions, the Warner diagram and the Delaunay tetrahedralization are dual to each other. They represent the same thing, but from a different point of view. You can see here both the Voronoi diagram and the Delaunay triangulation for our small set of about 30 points. The duality between the elements of the Delaunay tetrahedralization and the Voronoi diagram are the following. Notice that cells of dimensionality 0 become cells of dimensionality 3. For example, a Delaunay vertex is a Voronoi cell and a Delaunay tetrahedron is a Voronoi vertex. This vertex is located at the center of the circumscribed sphere to the uh, Delaunay tetrahedron. Also, an edge becomes a face, so we go from one dimension to two dimensions, and a face becomes an edge. As it's the case in two dimensions, in three dimensions, there are two different kinds of Delaunay tetrahedralization when the input is not only points. In 2D, when we had to deal with conforming and constrained Delaunay triangulation, we had not only vertices, but also straight line segments. In 3D, besides points and straight line segments, we also have planar faces, and these can form, as you can see here, a closed solid, and that solid could have holes or have disconnected parts. In practice, we often call the input that we use for constrained and conforming Delaunay triangulation in 3D, uh, this input we call it a PLC, a piecewise linear complex. So the edges have to be linear and the faces have to be planar. The generalization to 3D of constraint and conforming Delaunay triangulation is a very complex topic because basically the 2D concepts do not generalize directly. First, as a reminder, in 2D, the conforming Delaunay triangulation will add Steiner points so that real Delaunay triangles are constructed. In 3D, this can be done, but the problem is that in practice, very many extra vertices will be added. For cases where two planes are nearly coplanar, there actually do not exist algorithm to bound the number of vertices that will be uh, inserted by a polynomial. So in theory, there could be n to a power of 3 or n to a power of 4 extra vertices that are inserted. This makes the practical use of uh, conforming the Delaunay triangulation in 3D not attractive. The constrained Delaunay triangulation in 2D relaxes the Delaunay rule and doesn't add any Steiner vertices. However, notice that this is impossible in three dimensions. That is, we know that some arbitrary polyhedra cannot be tetrahedralized without adding Steiner points. The simplest example is this one, called the Schoenhardt polyhedron, named after the mathematician who described it nearly a hundred years ago. It's a very simple polyhedron, it has eight triangular faces, and yet it can't be tetrahedralized. In practice, extra vertices are therefore inserted to obtain a constrained Delaunay tetrahedralization. 
The aim of the algorithm is often to minimize the number of uh, Steiner points that are inserted. The details of the algorithms are beyond the scope of this lesson, but that doesn't prevent you from using some of the implementation of these algorithms. The best one, and the most used in my opinion, is called TedGen. It takes a PLC as an input and outputs a constrained Deloney tetrahedralization and tells you how many vertices were added. I show here an example in the context of the built environment. So I took two buildings from the 3D city model of Rotterdam and I created their PCL, which is a very simple text format in the case of TedGen. You can observe the result for only one building, which is filled with tetrahedra. These are, however, difficult to visualize. But if I take two neighboring buildings and I create their constrained Deloney tetrahedralization, I obtain this. Observe that the convex hull of the set of the two buildings is tetrahedralized, and now you can see the edges that are forming the tetrahedra that are located between the two buildings.